Our first lesson comes from the book of Daniel, the 12th chapter, verses 1 through 3. At that time, Michael, the great prince, the protector of your people, shall arise. There shall be a time of anguish such as has never occurred since nations first came into existence. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky, and those who lead many to righteousness like stars forever and ever. Here ends our first lesson. Our second lesson comes from the book of Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verses 11 through 18. And every priest stands day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since then has been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Here ends our second lesson. Our gospel lesson is according to St. Mark, the 13th chapter, verses 1 through 8. As Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be, and what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. The Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Greetings, sisters and brothers in Christ. The title of our message for this weekend is from our second reading. It's called The Full Assurance of Faith. Let us pray. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So my uh, daughter is the manager of a bookstore in Providence. And with regard to the whole last year and a half, two years almost, of the craziness we've been living in, there's a joke that's been going around bookstores that says, um, post-apocalyptic fiction has been moved to our current events section. Yes, um, it's sort of felt like we've been living in the midst of crazy times. And today, our readings address these crazy times that as much as the world has changed since the time of Jesus, so it has stayed the same. So here we have Jesus in today's gospel. He's walking with his disciples through the temple complex. And one of his disciples says to him, Lord, look what uh, large stones and look what amazing buildings. And Jesus says to his disciples, do you see all these great buildings? 
Not one stone will be left here. All will be thrown down. Not one stone will be left upon another. And that was horrifying, extremely frightening to his disciples. So then we're told in the next paragraph that later they said to him, what will be the sign that this is going to happen? And, and when will, will this happen? And uh, Jesus tells them that you will hear of wars and rumors of wars and there will be famines and earthquakes and it sounds like the news, right? And he said, nevertheless, do not be led astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he. Do not believe it. Do not go after them. So, um, he ends by saying these wars and earthquakes and famines and all of this crazy stuff going on will be but the beginning of the birth pangs, okay? So tonight, or today, I want to look at three things. I want us to look at the temple um, and what that represents. And I want us then to look at the scary times that Jesus' disciples were living in, and also the very scary times that we are living in. And then the third and most important point is I want to focus on how, as people of faith, um, even in the midst of frightening and scary times, we um, are not to live in fear, but we are to have that full assurance of faith, okay? So let's start with the temple and what it represented. The temple in Jerusalem was built about a thousand years before Jesus by King David's son, Solomon. And David um, had been a man, uh, a warrior, um, and so was busy uh, fighting battles um, and establishing the kingdom, a united kingdom, and defending the kingdom of the 12 tribes of Israel from their enemies. Um, but after he established the kingdom, there was a time of peace. And during times of peace, that's when you can have your building projects and you can create beautiful works of art. And the first temple built by King Solomon was beautiful. He hired craftsmen and artisans, women and men, and gifted in various artistic uh, areas to, to um, not only build the temple, but also to create these gorgeous furnishings for the temple. And the temple, of course, represents God's presence in our midst. Well, after Solomon, the kingdom was divided in two. And the northern ten tribes were Israel. The southern two tribes were called Judah, after the tribe of Judah, the larger of the two tribes in the south. And that's where Jerusalem is. Um, so we know from the history of our ancestors that in 722 BC, the 10 northern tribes were conquered. The kingdom of Israel was conquered by the Assyrians, but the southern kingdom of Judah held on for longer. And the people felt that God would never let anything happen to them because they had the holy city Jerusalem and the temple representing God's presence in their midst. However, they did not live lives of faith. They did not live lives that followed the commandments, the ways of God. And so God continued to send prophets to them, to preach to them and say, repent, turn, change your ways, or you will bring destruction upon yourselves. And sure enough, um, that's what happened. In 586 BC, 
They were conquered by the Babylonians and the temple was destroyed. It was leveled and all of the beautiful objects that these artists had created for the temple were carried off as booty of war. That was devastating for the people of Israel, for the people of God. They were, lived in um, exile for about 50 years and then the Persian king Cyrus set them free and allowed them to return to their homeland. So they did, and they rebuilt the temple, but they were now like poor, and, um, and many of them didn't return. They stayed in Babylon, now Persia. And uh, so the second temple was very small and simple and plain, and not big and impressive and lavish like the first temple was. Um, so fast forward about 500 years to the time of Jesus. King Herod the Great, um, who uh, is the villain of the story that we read at Christmas time when Jesus is born, he's the one who wanted to kill this Christ child. Um, he definitely had a lot of issues. However, one of his good qualities is he uh, was good with building projects. And one of his building projects was he had restored the temple um, that had been rebuilt, but in a very poor, humble, plain way. He really built it up and made it big and impressive and beautiful again. And that's the version of the temple that Jesus and his disciples are walking by. When Jesus says, not one stone will be left upon another, all will be torn down. And in fact, it is true, in 70 AD, the Romans destroyed the temple again, and um, it has never been rebuilt. So what Jesus, what many Bible scholars think Jesus is trying to get at is, what is it we put our hope in? What is it we put our trust and our confidence in? Is it the temple? Is it the building? Like uh, our ancestors, do we say, oh, God will never let anything happen to us. We have the temple, but they didn't live according to God's ways. They didn't follow the way of God. They oppressed the poor. They lived really uh, godless lives and yet somehow looked to those buildings as though they would protect them. God would never let anything happen to destroy those buildings. And they found out the hard way that, um, that that's not what this life of faith is all about. Our faith is not in the buildings. Our faith is in God, who the buildings... Um, you know, represent, but the buildings cannot contain the living God. And I can't help but think of uh, September 11th when we in here in the U.S. Um, had these buildings that were signs that were symbolic to other nations of our power, of our greatness, um, of our wealth, they were in the financial district, right? And all those things that um, other countries who, who were struggling to survive looked at us with our, with our wealth, with our power, and resented us. And um, we found out also the hard way that buildings can come crumbling down in an instant. 
that it is not our, our financial district that we put our trust in. It's not our big, lavish buildings that we put our trust in. No, we are to put our trust in God and God alone. I'll never forget that the day of September 11th, when the Twin Towers were hit, Beforehand, that morning, I was having my morning prayer, as I've done for every day of my life since I was a teenager. And my reading that day, that morning, I'll never forget it. It was from the book of Hebrews that today's second lesson is from. But it was the verse, um, Hebrews twelve twenty seven, and the verse was, That which cannot be shaken will remain. Isn't that amazing? That which cannot be shaken will remain. Boy, did I think about that hours later when the, these massive buildings, symbolic of our power and our wealth, came, were shaken and literally came crumbling down um, and it made us as a nation, as a people, say, what are those, those things which cannot be shaken? And in a strange way, I feel that after that horrible terrorist attack, I feel that our nation pulled together as one and said, this will not undo us. We, the United States, are more than this. This um, is not um, where, what our power and where our power really comes from. And we as a nation join together and think of it, Democrats and Republicans and and people of different races and ethnicities and all the things that in today's world divide us, we said, you know what? That stuff um, is all irrelevant. It's only that which cannot be shaken, which will remain. Our, our oneness, our unity as sisters and brothers, as citizens of this greatest nation on earth. So, Jesus's audience were living in very dangerous and perilous times. Um, after Jesus, um, the gospel writers passed the stories of him for some years orally and then wrote down their gospels. And we know that after Jesus died and rose and ascended, that the early Christians um, who followed the ways of Jesus suffered incredible persecution. And in fact, um, the Romans um, really uh, tortured uh, and killed Christians in the Colosseum as sport um, and destroyed the temple and... And so they were very scary and perilous times. And Jesus in today's gospel is trying to tell them um, to, during these scary and dangerous times, to hang in there and not be overwhelmed with fear. And to, um, to not be gullible, right? Uh, to not be gullible. Many will come and... and, and use my name and say, I am he, come do this, do that. Don't follow them, don't believe them. And he says, you will see nation rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be wars, there will be famine, etc." But then he says this strange thing, but these are just the beginning of the birth pangs. He doesn't say this is this will be the end, all will be gloom and doom. No, he says, this is the beginning of the birth pangs. A new birth is, is taking place. 
New life doesn't come about without some birth pangs, without some struggle and some suffering and some labor pains, okay? So, um, so today we are in the midst of some challenging days, right? We've, we're dealing with a global pandemic and then all these new strains of the global pandemic we're dealing with. Um, our nation being so polarized um, politically, racially, economically, the huge economic struggles. We're looking at where many of our younger people and not so young, I myself, are alarmed, alarmed about what the scientists are saying about uh, that our planet itself is hanging on by a thread and we have to completely change our lifestyles, turn, repent of how we've been treating this earth if we hope to even have a planet to leave to our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. And like those early disciples, we can feel overwhelmed. But the message is... Do not be afraid. Something new is being born. And in the second reading, it tells us that we are to approach um, the throne of God, it says. Um, we are to enter the sanctuary. Let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith. And let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for the one who has promised is faithful. Okay, we are not to live overwhelmed in fear in these scary times. No, we are to be crazy and daring enough to be hopeful even in times such as these. I love the fact that when my, um, my brother in Christ, Martin Luther, was asked, if you knew the world were going to end tomorrow, what would you do today? And Luther said, if I knew the world were going to end tomorrow, I would plant an apple tree today. I would plant a tree. In other words, um, God's in charge. Um, we should not lose hope. We should see, look for those signs of new birth. We should see the struggles that are going on in our world right now, um, not as death throes, but as birth pangs. Because God, who so loves this world, is in the process of bringing about a new birth. So our part, sisters and brothers, as overwhelmed as we may feel, is to hold fast, to hang on in that full assurance of our faith. Thanks be to God. Amen.
And now may God bless us and keep us. May God's face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May God look upon us with blessing and grant us peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve God and the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.